Okay, welcome to our next Hedega Shabbos Chaburah. Uh, today is the 21st, Chaf Aleph Sivan, and June 20th. We're going to do a quick review Hashem, of what we started last week about uh, the reality of bread, the showbreads, the Yud uh, based Lachma Panim in the base of Mikdash. We're going to do a quick review, like just a minute or two, and start to make it practical in the realm of Nutila Sidai. It may look very simple, it's going to sound to be a lot more involved than we think but it just shows you there's a lot of richness and depth when we take time to look at it that way. Okay, so we basically said that when it came to the lechem apanim, which came from uh, baking the showbreads, the last malach in this first category, we said that there were 12 showbreads and the 12 showbreads symbolized the 12 yud shvatim, the 12 tribes, which is the realm of soul, and the 12 months, time, and then the 12 parts of the land of Eretz Yisrael space. What is that teaching us? That the reality of bracha, blessing, came through the Jewish people, through the art, the way we relate to time in a holy way, and then through the holiness of the space. And then we took it one step further and said, but that's 12 individual shvatim. Ultimately, Melch um, David, Malchus of David, and through the base of Mekdash was coming to unify all the 12 into one unit called the Jewish people, the 12 months into one unit of a year, and the 12 parts of the land into Eretz Yisrael. What's our job? To take all the parts, link them all together, and to unify them. Amazing. How is it related to bread? So we said through the 11 malachis, and through the kneading of the dough, baking it, going all the way in, we're taking two opposites, we're blending it together, and we're unifying it from the outside in, all the way through. So the reality of bread itself was the symbol ultimate of divine unity, which is why we said it's a Torah commandment, which we're going to start today, on the precursor for Netila Shedaim, as opposed to all the other blessings that are Midar Bana on rabbinic level. Hamaitzi, uh, as we said from the Pasuk, Bachalta Vesavata Verachta. We eat, you should eat, uh, you should be satiated, and then uh, you should bless. And then we took one more part and we said, down to the letters Lamech has Mem, we said Lechem has three times Yudke Vavke, which we said is about bringing two opposite realities and unifying it through a third reality, which creates a sweetening, a rectification. In that we said we also have Choylem from the dreaming, right? From Shir Malis and the returning of all the Jews to Zion. Eshivasin Hayina Kechomim. So we said the letters also have the word dream in it and also have the derivation turned around to the word melchama, which means the war. It's this battle between earth and heaven. Is it one or the other or both and the ordering? And our job ultimately, we concluded with, and this is what we're gonna lead into today, that the bread that comes from heaven revealed itself on earth. And that's what we're trying to incorporate. So we're gonna to start today with al natil Yadaim. And then Nitesh in two weeks from now, since we'll be off next week, we will go through all the different parts about the one who's making the blessing, whether from oneself or to be might to the other people and all the various parts of that. Then we'll talk about the third part, the, the different kabanas a person could have when they're eating bread. And then finally the bench, and that will take us to the end of Tamas and Hashem. Okay, so we're gonna give one generic framework concept that we'll weave through all form, and then it will set the stage for what we're gonna say today. It's a beautiful, beautiful idea. The source is in the Tikkun Nezar, on Tikkun, uh, what's that, Ayin Gimel. And uh, I actually saw it again last week, was very excited to see it in the Ma'ari Naim. Uh, the Chernobyl Rebbe, who's one of the main Talmini of the Baal Shem Tov, brings it in partial, last week's Parsha Parsha Baal Leisacha. So we know that every action itself really is housed in the framework of a mitzvah. So a mitzvah would seemingly be an action, a commandment that God does. But God says further, do you know that embedded in my mitzvah itself is actually my name? What, what name are we referring to? Mem Sadi Vav Hey, that's what a mit mitzvah is. A commandment in which we connect and attach ourselves to. But where's your name? So Hashem says, look it up. The last two letters of mitzvah, Vav and Hey, correspond to the last two letters of my name. Okay. You got half, um, but we're missing something fundamental here. I don't understand. So the Zayar, the Tikkun Zayar says very explicitly that the Mem Tzadi, 
when you flip them into Adbash. And as we said, Adbash is a system of the 22 letters, Aleph to Tav, and they're interchangeable. So the first and last letter, Aleph and Tav, the Zacher and the Cave in the male and female dimension, base and Shin, Zacher and female, Gimel and Resh, Dalit and Kuf, all the way through. 11 letters, the first 11 are male, and the next 11 are female, and they're interchangeable as each Zacher has a Nekeva, and each Nekeva is parallel Zacher. Incredible, wonderful system in and of itself. Thank you, Kodesh Baruch Hu. The Mem in Atbash flips into Yud, and the Tzadi in Atbash flips into He, which is really fantastic. So the Mem and Tzadi, interestingly enough, are the female parts in the Atbash because of the last leaven. The, the first parts are the first slum and Aleph Tachav, so they correspond to the Yud, which is the Mem flipped, and then the He, which is the Tzadi. So now we get something very interesting. If we flip the Mem and Tzadi, then we actually get Yud and He, and that now spells straight Yud K and then Bav K. Interesting. So first question we ask is, we're going to do this very quickly. Just keep it very simple and clean. We're going to review it because it's the basis for understanding these next four abortas. First question is, if Hashem just wanted to say, this is my name, make it my name. Why do we have to have embedded in the mitzvah an encoding of your name? And even more, why do the last two letters actually are there in an open way? And the first two are encoded in Atbash. Okay. So the simple answer will be that the vav he are the external, the, the revealed parts of Shem Havaya, and the upper two letters are concealed. Okay, so you could say since the upper two letters, they themselves are concealed, they're concealed within the first two letters of Mem and Sadi, and we have to flip them into their positive form, and then they're now revealed. That, that could be the answer. But the Maureen Naiman, I love, it's just beautiful to see it again. It's, it's real chizuk anytime you see beautiful Torah a thousand times over. He asked, but th that's true, except one thing. A mitzvah itself is a revealed action. So therefore, all the letters should be revealed. There shouldn't be anything concealed in Shem Havai as it relates to a mitzvah. Now, again, it would be hard to call mitzvah UK Bavke because you can't say Hashem's name. But he's asking it fundamentally. Why is the Vav and He that part, those two letters are revealed, but the mitzvah is an action, and the action itself is re revealed. And he says, the Zohar explains very explicitly that even in a mitzvah, there's the external part of the mitzvah and the internal part. The external part of the mitzvah, the vav and he, is the actual action itself in its potential and revealed state. But the upper two letters, the mem and study, the reason they are concealed because that represents the kavana, the intentionality, the awareness, the mindfulness. Sounds familiar, huh? The first three of the nine conditions, right? Awareness, intent, and purpose. So in a mitzvah itself, the external part of the action, that's the vav and he. The internal part that we pask in that mitzvah tzrichim kavana, mitzvah needs kavana, especially if you're going to do something more in a holistic, complete, and perfected way, and it's certainly more refined and elevated way. You can't just do an action. It's not just an action. It's an ex action that expresses our avoida to connect to Kaddish Baruch Hu and reveal his full name in this world. And therefore, the Mem and Sadi also have to be engaged through intentionality, awareness, and purpose. And when we do that, we connect the inner part of ourselves to a Kaddish Baruch Hu's divine being. And rooted in that is the essence of a mitzvah in his divine being. And therefore, when we connect the, our awareness, intent, and purpose, and we connect the higher understandings and feel that inner elokus, that inner godliness in ourselves, we are actually awakening, stirring, shaking up those mem and sadi and causing them to flip the mem to the yud and the, the tzadi to the hey. And now that which was concealed in the action part, the inner intentionality, now gets revealed in you, and you now flip those two letters and create the circuitry, yud k vav k, and now the internal and external parts of a mitzvah are joined together, and now we can unify in Kodesh Baruch Hu's name, connect ourselves back to him at the root level, and then ask Tati, can we please, through this mitzvah right now, 
can we be a vehicle, can we be a Merkava to reveal your divine blessing in this world, your divine awakening in this world? And that when your name, Yud Kevavke, flows through us, may the totality of your divine being manifest in us in the cleanest, purest, and most elevated way from our innermost will to our thoughts, to our intentionality, down to our action, and that the actions that could come out should awaken something in this world, should produce change, should produce an awakening, should produce a divine revelation. So therefore, exactly the word mitzvah, mem tzadi, and then vav and hey, is not actually the problem, it's itself the, the mechanism through which we engage in a mitzvah. So in conclusion, and we're going to start with Natila Shaddai. In conclusion, a mitzvah itself is not just simply an action. It's, it's an entire, it's just, it's an incredible thing to even just think about. It's an entire system, a little mini world in and itself that he gives every Jew to engage in at any given time, whatever the mitzvah is relevant, to connect to him, attach our root soul to him, to plug ourselves into him at the very source, and then ask that we ourselves should be a conduit, a vehicle through which your divine blessing and your divine flow should come and be revealed in this world and forever bring something new and divine into this world, to eternalize the impermanence of this physical world into something divine. How utterly incredible. This is the Zayar Kodesh and the Tikkun Ezar, Tikkun Ayin Gimel, and this is what the Ma'ari Naim is bringing down in Parsha Loisacha, and this is where we begin with the four parts of bread. And the reason this is so important is for the simple following. It's not just enough to do an action or to even do it right. Hashem says, where are you in the mitzvah? I want you to engage the depths of your mind and your heart, your innermost being, to awaken the machus, the inner essence of your divine being. And I want you to connect it back to me. I want you to reroute it back to me. And then I want you to humble yourself in a way that you now become a conduit, a channel through which I'm going to pour my divine blessing, divine flow in this world and help fix and elevate this world. It's an incredible thing to have Kavana once for that is unbelievable. This is what the Mari Naim is telling us based on the Zayr, what every mitzvah at all the times could bring. Wow. Okay, so that's by way of introduction. Now, how does it lead to the first part? Okay, so we have seven rabbinic commandments in the Torah, in addition to the 613 Torah commandments. There's seven special rabbinic mitzvahs that have the status as if they're Torah-based. One of them is Nitzel Sidaim. And Nitzel Sidaim is a Hechsher mitzvah. It's a mitzvah that's an adjunct to washing for bread. So the simple love would be it's just, it's about cleaning your hands, getting them nice and clean, making sure all the schmutz is off and you're good to go. It clearly has to be more than that. Because if that was the case, the, the last three words of the bracha would be al levishas yadayim, which is actually brought down as a question. Levisha means to wash. So if, or rechitzas yadayim, or any form of washing, cleansing, or cleaning. Since none of those words are used, it clearly has to be more than just cleanliness is godliness, and we have to have clean hands to be a good boy or girl, because otherwise you know. Clearly, if it's a Durabanan mitzvah, that's a hechsha mitzvah to the Duraisha of saying hamaitzi and then benching, there has to be something much greater. We have to just take a few moments to sit with it and actually contemplate it and then be mindful of it. Mir Hashem going forward, especially in the context of what we just talked about, about mem sadi, flipping and creating a full gilu, a full revelation of Hashem Hashem in this world. What, 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 what could it mean? So the last three words, al netilas yedayim, the word that we're going to focus on, the word netila, is really the key operative word. The word, the one time we see netila is with al netilas lulav. So it doesn't just simply mean to take up, it means to take for the sake of lifting up. So why did Chazal fix this word, al netilas yedayim, as the basis? So we're going to look at this on a few levels. Our hands and our legs are the, said to be the more and most external parts of our being, the things that are the most on the outside. Yes, the ears have an outer part, many parts of our cells, yes, we have the seven orifices, 
but many parts of our being are is concealed fully on the inside. The most external, the most chitzoniest of our physical being is our yadaim and raglaim, which is why the kohanim, and we say this in the korbanos every day, the verses that have to do when they look, they're, they're washed, their hands, the chitzas yadaim, their raglaim, they have to metahir, their hands and their feet each and every day in, prepar in preparation for the divine service in the base of Mikdash. So on the one hand, the hands represent beautifully the way we externally interact with the outside world through the realm called action. And that means Hashem wants us to externalize, to reveal something in this world. And that's very important to do. It's great that you have things in your innermost will, in your mind, and even in your heart. But in the end, the Kaddish Baruch Hu wants us to act and achieve in a way that we reveal. And we see why in Chumash, many times the sentence structure is where it kicks off with a verb. And then from the verb, you have the subject or the object, depending which regular order, inverted order. And we see there's tremendous emphasis on the structure of action itself. The challenge of the action is when we get caught up in doing things, we run a few risks. One, the Chumash says very clearly, that my power and my strength in my hands is what's achieving it. So the first thing is when we do things and we are blessed with success, we could falsely attribute it to our own success. And that naturally breeds a real sense of arrogance. And the more successful we could become, the more arrogant we could actually be. Point one. Point two, when we do things, we get caught into habits, and habits can create habituation and automated living, right? And we call that mitzvah sanashim elumada, in a way that that regularity of being is very just automated living. And that automated living means we're doing an action, but we're losing our mindset. We're losing our heart set. We're losing our sense of higher purpose. And therefore, actions themselves, right, can be robotic and even more actions since they're the most external part the most revealed part that which is most tangible in a mitzvah the actions themselves you could think that's just all there is you don't relate to anything more than the tangible the external and the revealed and you don't your mind doesn't go into anything more so we have challenges of arrogance we have challenges of habituation and we just have challenges of superficial living where our actions ourselves can stay very simple and they can keep us in a very base level of living. So for all these reasons, we have to go into our actions and we have to start to relook at them and redefine them in a way. So in order to be able to see all three of these in a, in a very different way, as opposed to being arrogant, how could we be humble? as opposed to habituated living, how could we have renewed, revitalized living, and opposed to superficial living, we can have much more substantial divine service where we serve with a deeper sense of understanding, a heartfeltness that's brought into our actions. That's ultimately the goal. But how would we shift that in our actions? So comes the rabbinic commandment as a Hechsha Mitzvah to benching, on the Tilesidaim, and on the simplest level, just as the Kohanim, were coming to be metahir to purify their hands. That means they were meant to remove these parts of the, the challenging parts of the externality of the hands and be able to remove the self-servingness, remove it and simply get rid of it. So it's not about themselves. It's about something greater than themselves. So the ability to do that is the reality of tahara. To be metahir is far greater than physical cleansing because then it would be or the like. And we clearly see it's not that way. So the first part of washing one's hands is to understand that our job is to remove the ego, the habituation and the superficial ways of orienting to a mitzvah by washing to be metahir yadayim. Fascinating, first thing. Second thing, in the words themselves, al netilas yadayim, the Arizal tells us in the Sharkavanas of Natila Sudaim that there's an encoded word in those three letters. It just shows you how profoundly thoughtful and deeply reflective and upwardly connected our sages were. And in the Ruach they were able to bring tremendous things down from the simple level to the hand 
all the way to the esoteric. The head letters of Al Natila Sidaim, Aleph, Ayn rather, for Al. Natila is Nun, and Yadaim is Yud. It spells the word Ani. Ani means an impoverished person. Why do you need to have this here? So they're telling, oh, ready? We said that when you're washing your hands, you're not just removing the dirt. That's not the main goal or objective in any way. It's to remove the spiritual schmutz around your own ego, around your own self-servingness, around your robotic behavior, and around your own superficiality and living in a very external, superficial way. So our job is to be retired, to purify. So what would be the end result of purifying? Only to feel that we're an impoverished person, but in one way. I thought we're supposed to bench, and benching is ultimately a source of parnasa to bring down the shiras in this world. Why would we actively be awakening a feeling of impoverishment? And I think for those who are truly listening, the answer should be obvious. That the ego itself thinks we're the one who's the source of our blessing. We're the one who's the source of our energy and our hands and our movement. We're the source of our routines in life, and we're the source of all that what we do. And Hashem is saying right off the bat, Check your ego at the door. Impoverished, empty out your ego and realize that you are in and of itself. You are nothing, you can't do anything, and you have nothing. All your actions come from me. And your ability to do things, even in a consistent, regulated way, all come from me. So remove that from you, cleanse yourself spiritually, and purify yourself from that. The net result would be feeling like an Omni. But not an Ani in the way we would imagine someone living on a street as a beggar and Hashem should help on them in whatever way is needed. An Ani in the sense that while I have many things, nothing of them are truly my own. They're all gifts. They're all on loan. They're all possessional. But I have no true ownership of anything. Not what I have, not what I accomplished, not what I do, and ultimately, not even who I am. Not even my own actions tied to my own body, tied to my own spiritual being. None of it's mine. So part of the purification process, not the cleansing process, the purification process is to internalize this reality of being an Oni while being an Asher, to be an impoverished person while you're enriched itself. One very important kavana, this is their Rizo. Two, the Mishnah Brewer brings down that as the hitter mitzvah, of on the dime, we're supposed to do two things. When we wash our hands, we're supposed to do shif shuf, which is rubbing together, and hug ba, which is lifting, putting, putting your hands, your elbows to the side, and lifting your hands up to your moichin up here. Okay, so shif shuf, rubbing your hands, and hug ba, lifting them when you say al natilas yadayim, and drop them down. So, obvious question is. Why is this brought down in halacha at all? That sounds very different than, I can understand not cleansing, fine. You're purifying your hands. I wash my hands, which we'll get into different minhagim of how to wash. But in the end, I wash my hands, done. But now we're saying a hitter, not, not just a mitzvah, but the bonus part, the more beautified part of a mitzvah is to do shif shuf and hagba. So we will answer that in a moment, because I don't want to jump too far ahead, but we're going to see that while that's the beautification of mitzvah, and that will explain in more depth why Ani, let's go back to just how we wash our hands first. So some people will wash the hands, you would pick, okay, so you pick up the negovasa, you pass it to the left, because that's chesed coming to rectify gvura. Then you pour either two times or three times. We'll, we'll leave it at this for the simple level right now. And then the same thing, two times or three times. And again, your hand has to be fully covered. Why? For the obvious reason. If your external being is an expression of your ego and your arrogance and my efforts and my toiling and the regularity and roboticness of our own avoidance Hashem and our, the external ways, the superficial, we have to nullify all of it. The purification process itself is not a cleansing one. It's a nullifying of the ego in order to purify. And the end result of purification is you would feel yourself as being an Oni through the extremities of your hands. So if you're only doing dainty little, the fingertips, uh, 
it's not enough. It's got to be, you pour from your wrist and let the water go all the way down, top, front, and back on both sides. Very important to pour. And I said, well, I just, I, I got some of my fingers. It's not good enough. We want to, just like in a mikvah, we want to immerse our whole body, not even one hair should be standing out as a barrier. Otherwise, it would be an invalidated or disqualified tevila immersion and therefore require new re-immersion. So you have to be very mindful when you wash your hands. So first of all, pick up with the right, hand it to the left. There's an element of rectification in that because now the gvura is reconnecting itself back to chesed. It pours two or three times to the right and to the left, fully covering the hand from the wrist all the way down. And then we're acknowledging that we want to purify ourselves from the arrogance, from robotic action and from superficial living. And we want to cleanse ourselves in a way that if we can remove the ego part, we've gotten to the first step of getting to the heart and soul of Avna Tila Again, to flip and make the Mem Tzadi into Yud Hey to create a Shem Havayim. Okay, so that's the first part. Second part, we said the head letters are Ani, means an imper- impoverished person. We explained that already, because if we empty out the ego and the robotic behavior and the superficiality, then there's a place to fill something more. But what would, what would it be to fill more? So now we can answer, why do we need shif shuf and hagba, lifting up? So shif shuf is two opposites coming together. So it's not just you're physically rubbing, but you're taking two opposite realities and blending them together into one reality. So when your right and left hand rub in, the kavana is you're taking these two opposite realities of chesed and gvor, and melding them together, tiferes. But then what are you doing? You're taking your hands and you're doing hagba to your moichi, to your higher clarity, your higher consciousness, your higher wisdom. And you're saying, I don't want my actions to be an expression of the self. I don't want my actions to be robotic and I certainly don't want them to be superficial in any way. So I'm gonna lift up my hands to my moichi to remind myself What's the higher purpose? What's the higher mission? What is it I'm trying to accomplish? How I'm trying to serve a Kaddish Baruch How I'm trying to engage in a place of deeper humility with a, a deeper feeling of purpose and meaning and an awakening of I myself am nothing, but I'm lifting myself up to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. So one level is I'm lifting my hands up to the, the temples, the higher levels of my my inner wisdom to remind myself of the higher purpose of what I'm doing. Again, yeah, that's the mem and sadi, going to the inner intentionality. But I'm also lifting them up to say, I'm an ani. I, I am nothing. I have nothing. There is nothing with you, Dati. And I went and was Nata here, my hands, not rechitza, washing, but it was Nata here, my hands, to say these extreme parts of me reflect, it's not really who I am. It's not, it's not it's, there is no me, really. I'm coming to purify them. Then I'm going to do shif shif to rub them together to show my hands want to be unified in purpose. And then we want to lift them up to our higher moichin to remind ourselves what a mitzvah is and to have the right awareness, to have the right intention, to have the right purpose. That I want my hands and my very being to be an expression of serving a Kaddish Baruch Hu, serving him in a revitalized way, serving him in a purified way, and ultimately serving him in a way that there's an actual real relationship. When I lift up my hand, I'm lifting up my whole being, my extremities, the external parts up to this higher consciousness. And I'm lifting them up to say, it's all rooted in you. It's all driven by my higher consciousness. And I want my actions to reflect that. And as we start to do that, then we're going through the purification process and we're preparing ourselves to be makadash ourselves, to sanctify ourselves. And so you see that while it's a hidr mitzvah, it's a beautification of the mitzvah, it's not optional. It's really what we're supposed to be doing because the goal isn't to have clean hands. The goal is to purify the hands of its impurities and to remove the impurities, to bring purity through the extremities into the internal part of our being. And once we internalize the tahara, then we can lift our hands up and for this higher consciousness, serve our Kaddish Baruch in a greater way. But... Again, in Kabbalah, you're supposed to actually put your elbows tucked in, not out, because they're also external parts, and they could be subject to also impurity. So you're lifting, you're tucking hands in and just lifting all, all in the tilas yadayim, and then back down. So once you lift them to that higher place, when you bring them down, that last part is saying, 
I don't want it to be just abstract. I don't want it to be just, you know, deep thoughts, deep intentionalities, deep purposes. But the whole point, the hands are extremities and the extremities are actions and the actions are things of doing that reveal and bring something out in this world. So after we do shif shuf, rubbing the hands together and hagba, lifting it up, then we actively, mindfully bring our hands down knowing that they've now been rectified. We're now an ani, on the tilas yadayim, but now that we bring our hands down, we're preparing ourselves to what? Engage in ashirus, en en enrichment. But what's the enrichment driven by now? The anius itself, the impoverishment. That, that knocks out the arrogance. It draws in a sense of humility. Now it says, Tati, I want to be that vehicle to reveal your divine presence. I want to use my actions. I want to say the blessing. I want to engage in the eating. I want to engage in the after blessing of Bir Qasim Mazlein. I want to do all that, but it's not for the sake of I. It's that the I is totally in the place of service because that's all that I'm here to do. That's the only reason why I exist. And you give me this opportunity right now in soul time and space to do this? So here, this blessing called al Natila Yedayim is called the Heksher Mitzvah, a mitzvah that's approximate to, it's connected to the Iker one of Hamaitzi Lechem. But boy, is this a hush of Midr Mitzvah? Why? Because we see our job is to remove the tomb in our being, to bring down the Tahara. And then once we have the Tahara, we lift it up to draw down the Kedusha from our higher consciousness and above, then to draw it back down when we lower our hands down to our waist. And then we move into the mitzvah deraisa of Hamaytzi Lechem in Aretz. So you're going, wow, all that was just hachana, was just preparation as a hechsher mitzvah itself. But now let's put it back to what we originally said, and we'll tie it up, and it fits gorgeous. We originally asked, why is the letters Mem Tzadi and then Vav He partially the name of Hashem and partially not? So the Vav He represents the, the mitzvah in its potential state being revealed. And the Mem Tzadi is the inner awareness, the intent, the in purpose, the higher serving with our higher consciousness and connecting our very being, our inner essence, back to Kodesh Baruch's reality. And then to draw back down from him through us back into this world. So when we do that and connect to the highest parts of that consciousness, that's the yod -Hey. Then when we put it into the action, that's the vav -Hey. And when we in integrate and incorporate our higher consciousness and mindfulness, an inner sense of purity, an inner sense of service, an inner sense of impoverishment existentially, and then give it back so we're now in tandem partnership with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. We're saying, Tati, thank you ever so much for the merit in this moment to serve you, to partner with you, to reveal, feeling that awareness, feeling that consciousness through the rubbing the hands, lifting up and then drawing it down. It's so incredible. That consciousness is what we want to connect to Hamatzi Lachim itself. It's an extraordinary thing. So we see the profundity of it's not removing the dirt, it's not even a cleansing process. It's a purifying process for the sake of drawing down holiness that's in a potential state in our mind, then through our actions, and then all that is in preparation for saying the blessing, enjoying beautifully, eating with the right kavanas, which again, we'll get into in, in shears two, three, and four, and then saying hazan, all is one packaged unit, Think of how different you could be. Think of how changed you could be. Think how possibly you could actually be transformed as a person. And this little small action, which looks very quick, like, you're going, what did you just do? So that's the Vav and He. But the mitzvah, the Zarek Kodesh is telling us, the Mem Sandi, it's our obligation to go from the external part of the external to the internal part of the external mitzvah. And that is our mind and our heart and activate it, understand the mitzvah, get connected to the awareness, be mindful of the intention, understand the higher purpose, be real with it, carry an actual emotional and intellectual space for that, and then put it into the action itself. And then you, you are the one, you are the catalyst that is flipping the mem and study into yod and hey, 
you're connecting the Yudke Vavke connection, and guess what? You are bringing the reality of a Kaddish Baruch into this world through you, that you both feel the enrichedness of being a partner with him, and you feel the impoverishment, because I am nothing of my own, I have nothing of my own, and there is nothing of my own. And you hold space for enrichment and impoverishment at the same time, and that's the true kavanas behind, or at least some of them anyway, it's the basic ones of on the Tilas Chedaim. And now we understand what the Memsadi flipped into the Yudkei Vavke is, how we ourselves become a conduit of revealing Shem Hashem in this world, and from Marba increasing Kavot mind. and you're going, wow, every mitzvah, every time, has that spiritual genetic encoding to reveal Hashem's divine presence and ultimately his divine unity in this world. And when we, when we unify the internal and external parts of the mitzvah itself, and we bring it together in a holistic way, we ourselves become a conduit to reveal the infinite in a finite form. And as a result, to eternalize the impermanence of this physical world into something di divine, and ultimately as a means to ready and prepare the world for reality of redemption. How awesome it is a mitzvah, how incredible, even the Heksha mitzvah. The Hamaytzi Lach, I mean, our bread was so special, so important in the base of Mikdash, that in our own homes, when we engage in the mitzvah on the Tilas Yedai, in preparation for Hamaytzi, how important is the preparation itself to tell us how to go forward? You could be a changed person forever. May we merit to start hearing it, thinking about it, internalizing and living it, and be ever so thankful for being a yid and having Hashem's precious mitzvahs. Okay, so let's stop with this. Let's have some comments, questions, reflections. And again, there's a lot in what I said, so I want to digest it, but it's very relatable. It's very beautiful. It's very incredible. Now, after this, then Mitzvah Hashem, uh, two weeks today, we will do Hamaitzi uh, and go through the same thing and we get to understand. Okay, please, comments or questions. Or reflections. Um, I'll just share one thing that I really appreciated. Please. Um, so it's kind of hard for me because um, I'm not a lot to eat bread, so and I generally don't wash other than for Pesach. But just the concept of it that you know we say Shema three times a day, and the Shema is supposed to like reground us to Hashem and His purpose and our lives. And I just love the fact that in, in earlier times when we didn't have supermarkets where we could buy a million different things, most people had bread at a meal. And that even at our meals, which is the time we broke, at least for men, but women too, broke from our work, which we, you know, that's what we do. And that's our power and that we, we put into the world that Hashem was even saying, here, I'm going to give you a break when you eat. Before you even get into your eating I'm going to give you an experience to nullify yourself to truly know that it all comes from me. So it's just like he set up throughout the day in our tefillos, in our eating, all the things that we have to do throughout the day, this constant reminder that really he is everything and we truly are nothing. We're partnering with him in this world, but we truly are. It's all coming from him. So that's kind of what came through there. Beautiful. Okay. So I think let's highlight the point. We have an abundance of food. And a lot of times for all sorts of reasons, um, I only wash on Shabbos or maybe Rosh Chodesh, whatever your shita is, or I'm too tired, I'm too exhausted, okay? I'm too lazy, I just don't feel like it. Oh, it takes so much effort in the washing and the hamotzi and then the beshi. I, I, just, I just can't be bothered. So what are you doing? You're putting, eating in a very limited human way. Now, again, if you truly are legitimately tired and you just don't have the right enough energy, okay, maybe you push yourself, maybe you don't. But if we take the lazy man's way out and don't engage, we miss the whole reality that Hashem is feeding us as opposed to I'm eating. And it's for my own immediate pleasures and my own indulgences and what's ever most gratifying for the moment. We strip it out of all the ruchnias. We strip out the divinity of the eating. We strip out the higher avoida, and the opportunity to serve a Gadosh Baruch Hu in a meal, which again is why the table is referenced as Mizbeach. It means our eating is literally a korban to Hashem. You're going, wow, that's really like high and off. The answer is no, that's Kedusha Dik eating. That's what a Gadosh Baruch Hu wants us to be. We wouldn't have all the Taivadik challenges around food if we were eating for the two of us, soul and body. 
But once we're eating for the one of us, the body only, not the soul, and there is no voida, and there is no higher purpose and intention and meaning. And it's just immediate pleasure, immediate gratification for the moment. We strip the soul out. Literally, it's a barren mitzvah. It's a bereft soul. It has the vav hey, but not the mem tzadim. And that means what? You miss the opportunity because you said I did a mitzvah, but Hashem said, didn't you know my name's in there? Come find me. Go get the mem and sadi. Flip it with the inner awareness, intention, and purpose. Awaken it in yourself. Connect it to the outer action and then serve me in a more full, complete way and turn that action into an experience that's an expression of divine service. It's an expression of our relation to Kodesh Baruch and it's the ultimate expression of our own personal shleimus, our wholeness, and revealing Hashem's divine presence and unity in this world. You're going, that is so lofty to think about a mitzvah on the ground. But that's really what the Zara Kodesh is telling us and what the, the kavanas of a mitzvah is and the halachas behind it. And even the halachas themselves have a hashkafa in every halacha. Why is it a durum? But a mitzvah that's a hechsher, because you're talking about something so lofty, but what bread is, what we spoke about last week, you need the necessary preparation of purification to get to the kedusha of that experience and feel your own inner divinity. And where does it come through? The hands itself. And how do you use your hands throughout the day? So you come to real, and the language that's used, Right, and just like Al Nutilis Lula, we should lift it up and then clap it back to our heart. We bring our hands back into our heart because we want our whole inner world to be engaged with eating. We want it to be part of it. That we want to feel somehow we're a little different, a little change, and we're not just eating for the one of us. We're eating for the two of us. So as we just start to think about that, you're going, wow. And even if you don't watch, but just learning about it, it's a merit in itself. And if you're connected to people who are. Be mindful to say, when they say, I'm to say amen. So you're connecting yourself and you're affirming that through your amen, which we know is very important, the Gemara brachas, to say amen, even greater than the person mentioning the bracha or iterating the bracha. So therefore, the whole expression of it is really a declaration to Kaddish Baruch of our divine service to know. And we're willing to trade ourselves up each time. It, it really is wondrous if you just think about it. And again, we don't typically take time to sit and learn the laws of the basic meaning, the deeper meaning, and the highest meaning, and how to actually bring it into our day-to-day -day service. And again, whether you're watching only on Shabbos or not, you watch on Rosh Chodesh or not, Yom Tov or not, special days that are mesugal, that are treasure days for washing, and there are many, obviously, as we know, you come to realize that you're awakening the inner Kedusha in time through the soul. And that, that mitzvah itself is really stirring inside, which means you're, you're being rattled, you're being shaken up, you're being changed and hopefully refined and even redefined anew in a slightly different way because of that. So when we're mindful and heartfelt through the action itself, we really understand we're bringing Shem Havai into this world through us. It's the greatest expression of meaning and purpose for yourself in a moment of time. That's the depth of what a mitzvah is. And this is what al Natilis Yadayim is when it could be. And it also says, even after the eating is over, which we'll get to at the very end of the four shiurim, you don't want that experience to end in Natilis Yadayim, in Hamaitzi, in the eating and in the bench. You want it to carry over with you. So there should be a roisha, an impression of that built into your body and soul that will continue past the time itself. So it affects part of that day, maybe even further. So we see, we, we, can, we maybe are never quite the same again after a mitzvah, if we allow ourselves to be fully in it. But to be fully in it, we have to break the ego, we have to break the habitual robotic behavior, and we have to break our superficial living. And therefore, the very... Mitzvah Durabanan of Al Nutilis Yadayim itself is the way to do it in preparation for Hamites, which again, you just you just marvel at the words of Chazal, at the mitzvahs Durabanan Duraisa, and everything has an ultimate divine encoding if we're willing to be wowed, if we're willing to be marveled, if we're willing to go, this is just, and that means there's no such thing as anything mundane, nothing in eating. I don't care if you have the same bread every day, and as, as was said before, in earlier generations where they had very little, and if they were fortunate, if they had a piece of bread and a little soup or water, 
that bread was their whole sustenance. And what do they have to ultimately internalize? That their whole existence is dependent on the Kodesh Baruch Hu, and the very survivalness of their basic sustenance for the day tied to that bread that they made or they bought in a market, what have you, much more connected to the, the, the first 11 malachas, the malachas in general, what it took, and their simple, simple basic existence was fundamentally tied to Kodesh Baruch Hu in basic eating. But it wasn't simple. It was very foundational and very fundamental. We, we, we almost revel at their simplified living. But simple doesn't mean they're simpletons. No, no, no. Simple means they were deeply rooted, connected to the foundations of Yiddishkeit and brought it all the way down. They were not obscured or confiscated by the, confounded rather, by the enormity of all the foods going on, all the distractions, all the activities that we're not even in eating. We have to work to remove the distractions just to be in eating and to be mindful and then to eat for the body and soul and then to bring these higher, more pure kavanas and then turn our eating to Veda and their Voda as an expression of revelation to reveal the Elokus and us, the Elokus from a Kaddish Baruch one, to even potentially have a basis to unify his presence in that moment. That's elevated eating. And the extent to which we're caught up in the quantitative parts of food, so much of this and that, and even the taste of it. Oh, well, it's not quite cooked here and it doesn't have enough spices here and it's not enriched. There's so much talking about food, about it, but you're not in it and you're not growing through it and you're not lifting it up to its higher place. So it's food, it's food. And you're missing the whole soulful point of food and the divine service for the sake of more taste, more yummy, more filling, more calories, even if it's more healthy and more organic. and all, That's great. It's still the external part of the mitzvah. We want to get to the internal part that our soul is engaging in that experience. Our soul is being satiated by it. Our soul is experiencing being fed from a Kodesh Baruch Hu, And our soul is being fueled by a Kodesh Baruch Hu for greater service and to draw down divine nourishment and the closeness you have in that. That's eating for the two of us. You got to minimize the amount of food, the kinds of food, simplified eating, not get so caught up in all the various forms of preparation and the various forms of tasting. That, because every bit you put into that beyond a certain point, you're missing the soul part. And we pay a big cost for that. And clearly what we're learning just by the first level of the mitzvah of Hamaitzi, by the Heksha mitzvah of the Tilos Yudayim, we're saying, if this is how important the preparation is for Hamaitzi, well then, boy, my goodness, how important is Hamaitzi itself, which we'll get into Metz Hashem, our next Chabor in two weeks. And then eating, how important would it be to eat as a conduit, eating with Hashem, eating before Him, receiving divine sustenance for Him. How I mean, literally inspiring, and then benching from that place, and then using all that newfound energy to go serve Him anew, it would absolutely be a changing, transformative experience. So then where is your soul? Where are you? And where are you becoming? So that's a beautiful point that we brought out. Yes, earlier generations from the food they had to make and grow to the simplified eating. We want to try and simplify our, our lives on the goof level so we can connect more deeply to the Nishtama level. Very important point. Thank you. Okay, others or we have a few people, so please feel free. We have a good 20 minutes or so. So please feel free to comment, question, reflect, whatever you like. Shalom. Shalom, shalom. Thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate this shiur in particular because I I try Nitilat Yudayim is a mitzvah that I try to connect to in a special way. So that's I appreciate that, and I just wanted to know um well or comment that um the whole fact of that nowadays we eat less bread, but it seems like it goes along with everything everything else that's happened. Just lost you for a moment. We want to make sure we hear everything you said. Okay. We'll just let you know when we can hear you. You, you said about Nathil Sudan was a special mitzvah for you, and then we lost you right after that. So we want, please, hopefully we'll come back on. Can't wait to hear the rest of what you're going to say. You need to 
Okay, let's try again. Hopefully this time will work. Yes? Oh, I, I, I wasn't here. Wasn't. Okay, yeah, we didn't, couldn't hear you the whole time. After the, after you said your favorite mitzvah is Natila Shaddai and ah, okay. simplified healing, so, we didn't hear you anymore. So just repeat, please. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was saying that it seems like the fact that we eat less bread, so we bench less often. It's right. connected to everything about the way of our life now that every, everything is in abundance and everything is so, um, like, we don't depend on, even even in Eretz Yisrael where we have to pray for the rain, but now they have all, ways of, all kinds of ways of bypassing it. So everything is, uh, like, make it, makes it harder. So also in this way, it seems like the fact that we don't have to bench all the time, or we don't have to say Amotzi because there's so much other kinds of food, it makes it harder we have to pay more attention in order to connect. So I, I was would love to hear your, your comments. So I, I, that, that's a nice connecting point to what was the comment that was before. We can open that up a little bit, right? It could be a blessing abundance. Because remember, we were talking about, we were negating the human abundance. We were connecting to our inner impoverishment. And then when we see ourselves as a vehicle, we connect back to the enrichment again but through impoverishment. The challenge with just physical abundance itself is it strengthens It strengthens that, oh, we're so powerful. We have so much food and we're so wealthy and we're so endowed and I can get all the delicacies and you know, I can get any fruit I want any time of the year, whether it's in season or not, because it gets shipped from South America or it gets shipped from Australia, wherever. And, Yes, it's interesting we're a globalized world. And yes, we have very abundant living that we can pretty much get any kind of food we want if we're willing to pay the price. Although very now, very interesting enough with, we'll just say the, the food chain challenges and the food shortages and all the transmission processes of transporting foods and shipping it and all the various things tied to it. We'll just leave it to keep it as a uh, political in every way possible we see the very reality of the food chain itself is starting, people are starting to feel a little more, well, hey, we don't have those things in the store anymore, or hey, we're feeling the inadequacy of this, or hey, we have less of this, or hey, we have to pay more for even less. We're starting to feel some of that physical abundance being diminished. And for those who get easily panicked and feel, uh-oh, Oh, well, what happens if I don't have my this thing and my that food and that? And you can clearly see what is the Kaddish Baruch Hu telling us when we get back to very simple and simplified living and we connect to the basics and we connect the basics back to him and we transform our basic eating into ultimate divine service. We're the most enriched through the impoverishment. But when we relate to our own hands and our own powers and the power of globalization and the power and the opportunities of getting and having anything anywhere at any time willing to pay the right price and then to boot we become even demanding about well, what do you mean it took 72 hours you said it would be here in 48 hours i'm tracking it i can virtually know every mile where it is and i want it for free or i wanted 20 because the amount of entitlement is utterly shocking and ego inflamed to the utter extreme extreme and a cottage bottle is going to say, you know what? As we're getting ready for redemption and for Gulatic reality, that ego based existence has to be smashed. Why? Because the, the world has to be prepared as a clea, as a vessel to receive my divine light. So this new Or Chadash, this new ultimate light of redemption, could come in this world that we could all be meritorious. But Kohlsman, the whole time that it's very deeply entrenched in ego based living, and a false sense of abundance. We have physical, earthly abundance, but the truth really is, from that place, deeply impoverished, but not in an impoverished sense like a ruchmis, like ani, a spiritual ani. No, we're physical ani in that sense. A spiritual ani is, is humbled, that realizes they have nothing on themselves and their whole existence in the Baruch They're empowered in their spiritual impoverishment because from there they can create enrichment. But when it's your ego based and it's from a place of total abundance, it's you're not it's not even true spiritual impoverishment. You're impoverished on the body level, even though it's soul impoverishment, but the impoverishment is so low, it's so counterfeit, 
you don't even realize what you're missing. You're missing something so deep. You're so, literally, just the word is impoverished. You're so diminished in your ways and you don't even know it until what happens. Your, your external abundant living is shechted and it goes into a chaotic descending state as the market this and the potential depression that and global this and that. And we know there's an immense amount going on and stirring in the world. What's really happening? Hashem is saying, now you've got to choose between who, think, who you think runs the world versus who truly runs the world. Who is the author of the world versus who thinks they run and control the world. So at that point, the negative side of impoverishment comes in and people do really crazy, desperate things like pick up guns and make mass shootings and do hijackings and do all because they act out their sense of negative impoverishment as opposed to humble their ego, submit themselves and give themselves to Kaddish Baruch Hu, and from a place of healthy spiritual impoverishment, create deeper humility. And in that humility, Hashem can bless them immensely. Regardless of what they have, there's some mech bechelko. They're the real ushers. We don't pay kayavos. So that's the opportunity at hand. But calls man that there's this immense amount of abundance. You can have anything at any time you want with the right price and even in your own time. It inflames the ego in such an extreme way. Very, very hard to have a redemptive reality where God says, hey, this world ain't big enough for both of you. Do you think it's your world and you run it and it's all about you? I, I can't remember. It's Gemara and Satan and Ham and Aleph. We both can't exist in the same place. So Hashem ultimately has to lower humanity in order to internalize a healthy sense of spiritual impoverishment. And from there, we can have true divine enrichment while still holding on to our impoverishment. But when you don't have it that way, we get all crazed with our abundance and everything until it's compromised and diminished and eventually, yep, taken away. And then what? We go into deep depressions. And we get absolutely crazed. And then we see the Nefesh Bahamis in the extreme. And all the pilfering that people will do in the most stealthy or not even hidden ways, overt ways. And acting on all their aggressive tendencies to secure their basic survival needs and their domination over others. And means they're no longer enriched. They're impoverished in the lowest sense possible. And they lower themselves down, all from the place of human abundance where simple eating is just the opposite. We are so spiritually rich. But the, the impoverishment is what empowers us. And there's the impoverishment brings them right down. And that's the chaos that's coming into the world now. We have to rectify it and turn it into higher tikkun. And if we do that, we're all the better for it. So it's, to you, both these comments, it's very good to get into habits now to start simplifying your life, going back to the basics and fundamentals feeling deeply enriched while being impoverished in those, feeling like you truly have everything and be absolutely happy and joyful with the, the very basics and connecting it all back to Hashem and working hard to break out of your ego, working hard to break out of your habitual living and working hard to break out of your own superficial, trite ways of looking, experiencing things and bringing your life to more substantial divine service from a place of enrichment. And we would start to do that all this other stuff, it just melts away. It was all distraction to take us away from the true reality of what we're trying to do. So that's, that's where it begins. The sun is fantastically genius at give us everything we want in the physical sense and make us impoverished in the spiritual sense in the negative way. And then as our physical things get stripped away, we get crazy because now we go into scarcity mode and you know what happens. And when electrical outings happen, you know what happens, right? An enormous amount. When there's no fear in the world, the amount of pilfering and the amount of murders, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's staggering what happens. A lawless, chaotic world. The good news is Hashem is creating that reality as we speak to slowly break the world out of one limited world order to get it ready for an unlimited ultimate world order. But we have to prepare ourselves to receive that. And that means it's okay to give up some of our external, superficial, abundant, comfortable, qualitatively higher living for just getting down to the basics. But realize the deepest fulfillment, the deepest pleasures, and the deepest elevations are in those very places. That's what bread is coming to teach you. And matzah, by extension. Does that make sense?
are you able to, and maybe someone can help unmute Rivka if she's not able to. Yeah, I got it. Okay, yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Is that, is that what you were addressing? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's re really important thank points. You, you. Yeah, there's, see, what's beautiful, these comments that we're saying right now is, Hashem wants us to go back to the good old days, the times of the Beis HaMikdash, the times when Elias Arego meant just that, a real Elias Arego on our feet or some other version of that, but that we would experience everything firsthand, including making breads all the way from the field. And, and that simple living means it's so enriched, just like flour can be enriched. Oh my goodness, our life is so enriched because we're seeing the Yad Hashem, the real hand of Hashem, right? The Yad Bahashkacha in every way, profoundly so. It's incredible, but the more we paradoxically live with Ashiras in the external sense, then unfortunately, even the Yidin, our mitzvahs become very plush with external parts of the mitzvah in whatever way but we lose the heart and soul of what the inner mitzvah is, the yud and hey of the mitzvah that becomes flipped from the mem and sadi, then we're not here to bring the shem Hashem. We're not here to unify Hashem. We're not here to be conduit for his divine blessing and his holiness. So then we're actually outside the mitzvah, even though we think we're on the inside. So on one level, it's beautiful to do a mitzvah in action, but it's far from complete. And the fact that we pass in the mitzvah, mitzvah tzricha kabbara, it doesn't need Kavana, right? Because the Kavana is the soul of the, of the mitzvah itself, even though it's an action, but the internal part of the external part of an action is the soul part, is imperative for us to connect those together, to join them, and give them and connect them back to Hashem at its root. It's not just for Natila Sidaim. This is for every single one of the positive and negative commandments. It's to connect the Shamor and the Zachar, the remembering and the guarding against the 240 and 365 to have our complete structure because it's all about avoid that. Otherwise, even the mitzvah itself is in Gaulis and we're in Gaulis from the mitzvah. And that's an extremely painful thing that we water it down and it becomes so trended and trendoid about all these very superficial external ways. And it's almost like you just have the body without a soul, which feels like it's, it's like a carcass. So we don't want that before our Kaddish Baruch Hu. We want to offer it up in the most complete way, in the most full way, in the most purposeful way. And we have to change our perspective or upgrade it. And the fact that you've already been working in the Tila Stam for a while, great. So you start to put these different aspects in and really hold space. It's, it's an, it, it, one on the Tila Sudaim could potentially change you and your Yiddish kite forever. Whether you do it most of the time or not, it's this perspective of seeing it and trying to live this way. And again, this connects back to our previous Chabor uh, last week about how to look at Lechem and the Lechem upon him in the base of Mikdash and how Chashev it was and how we can actually bring it into our home as a mini base of Mikdash and really relive that, reenact it, and even as a merit to help restore and bring it back into the world again. Not that it can't come, it's just we have to want to connect to Hashem in that very intimate, meaningful way. We can't be afraid to want something very beautiful and special and, and unlimited in its nature, timeless. But we have to be willing to give away and trade up the lesser pleasures for the far greater ones, the things that are ego-based and robotic living and very superficial. And we have to be willing to trade them up and say no. I have to give up those parts of me for something much higher, something much more refined. Why? Because that is the reality of who I am. That is Hashem's reality in this world. And that's what we're all aspiring to. We all want it. It just, like the 11 malachas, it takes work on each one of ourselves to do all of these. We just can't expect to have lofty living without changing ourselves proportionally. So that's the opportunity here. Okay, great. We have time, I think, for another one more comment or so, and then we'll stop, please. So thank you so much. This is so, um, it's so the core of, of so many, many, many things. And, and um, it just kind of, I can't actually wait to, to, to do all Natilas Yadayim again, to, to just, right. you know, try it, try it higher. So I really thank you. 
And Rivka, your comment on eating less bread, that's amazing too, because because we are. And and that's really significant as well. So thank you, everybody. And you too, Basia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's start it off by saying it that way. So I, I think let, let's take, I like your last point. I like the word you said beautifully too, Marsha, to be able to lift the mitzvah higher. It's not that we're not already doing a good job, but if we're holding at a B level, let's try and make it an, an A minus or even an A level. And trying it on doesn't just mean in the action. I love how you, what you really were saying is trying it on means doing it in a higher way to feel that higher change in yourself, to feel that higher aspiration in yourself, to feel that higher perception of yourself in that higher divine way. And then don't just try it on. If you go to a, a beautiful clothing store and you see your ultimate dress you're going to wear on Shabbos and it's 50% off and you look at this and you try it on and you feel like, Mama Shaquit, you feel regal and dynasty in the most incredible ways. Machus to the extreme. You you can't wait to wear it. But when you put it on, it makes you feel in a much bigger, greater way. And you know, somehow, you're a different person when you wear that. We are supposed to be affected by clothes. That's not being superficial. If we try on a mitzvah that way, the action, the correct action, the right kavana within it, the underlying meaning and purpose, and then it changes us. We feel a little bit different. Our mind and heart gets awoken. We see ourselves in a different way. The experience itself was greater. It actually became more of a divine avayda. And there was real devekas, real connection to Kodesh Baruch and we felt the elevation. Guess what? Don't just try it on and take it off. Keep it on. Say, what if I did this once a day or every few days? And then in between the Amnitilis Yadai, I want to hold on to that consciousness. I want to take it into my mind and heart. The problem may be is, um, honey, um, you, you've been doing the Amnitilis Yadai, it's 10 minutes now. Every, there's 20 people at the table waiting for you. Mm, 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 I'm not finished yet. I mean, you're implying. You're so, okay, so we have to be mindful of others. But the point is, we want to internalize this consciousness to such a level that it permeates our being, and it's not just tried on as in a very limited, a very temporary, and a very cursory way. We want it to remain with us. We want it to stay with us. We want it to be more permanent. We want to be able, from the identity, from the word identify, we want to identify with it so it can become part of our new identity. And as we grow into it higher, we can be that higher person. And not just for a little bit now, perhaps for longer, and maybe over time, for a lifetime. And when you do that, you know you're affecting your oil and hava. You're creating a higher level of your eternal existence by how you experience yourself in this world. And then I would add one more important thing, because it just brought from what Marsha had said and what the, everyone had said it was beautifully. I like this intimate group, so thank you. Is that don't just do it for yourself. Inspire others. Inspire higher for others. Share it with others. See if you can teach one other person a little bit of the understanding, a little bit of the meaning, a little bit of the language, a little bit of the word ani, a little bit of the shiv, shuf, and hagba, of, of, of rubbing your hands and lifting up and then drawing down. And as a heksha mitzvah and all the different parts we talked about, and that it's changing, don't be afraid to share it with someone else. And if you need the sources again, you need to be reminded, please, you'll ask again next week or the next session. I'll be glad to reiterate again. The Al Natila Sudan, the Rashi Davis. The head letters was their was their rizal. The Shif Shushan Hagba, the Mishnah Bro brings it down, is a is a hitter mitzvah in halacha around Al Natila Sidai. And uh, what other parts that we all the different parts, the, the word Natila from the word Naital is, is self-explained, means to take to lift up, like the word Natila's Lula. So we see that all the different parts really fit. The just the challenge is now you want to plug yourself in higher. And I think I'm going to leave with this, to boldly see yourself in a higher way, not just to be lifted up in that moment, to see yourselves in a higher divine image, to be bold enough to see yourself in a holy light and say, that is the true essential me. And anything else is just not becoming. It's just not sufficiently me. We should merit to live in our highest light, aspire in our highest way, serve a Kodesh Baruch in the highest realm, bring his highest name in the most full, complete way, and to convert each mitzvah that looks like just an action 
and even just a physical mitzvah into a soulful spiritual mitzvah and a place to reveal Hashem's divine name and its completion and to actually get the world ready for a redemptive reality that starts today. So thank you everyone for showing today. I appreciate it. Your comments and reflections, excellent. It should be a schos for our marriages, our families, our communities, Klaliso and the Shechina itself. And we should be zeichet to the world that's more purified and more holy intrinsically so we can be truly ready to receive the ultimate divine presence in this world in a real way, in a permanent way, and an ultimate eternal way.